So yes, uh, today is our annual election. Actually, it's, it's not the first uh, election we've held as a Fellowship of Free Thought, but it is our first um, sort of annual election on the regular schedule um, that was written into the bylaws. So it's kind of an exciting uh, day for us. Um, we're going to be picking a new board of directors. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to, um, as I was going to explain um, the process that we use in certain amount of voting for our elections, um, I thought it might be interesting to also include um, a little bit of science, uh, some stuff that uh, you may have seen uh, in the media. It's been, uh, it's been popularized a little bit here and there. Um, but the idea of um, what are our, our genes, uh, what effect do our genes play in, in how we vote and uh, how, we, how we engage in the political process. So um, why do people vote? Why, you know, what, is, what is the motivation there? What, what happens in, in people's minds when they go vote? Is it, is it a, a case where they've uh, made themselves aware of all the different candidates, all the different issues? Um, have they researched everyone's backgrounds? Are they fully familiar with um, how every single candidate stands on every possible issue? And are they, they certain that, that that person can really, really represent them? Um, have they uh, gone through every single possible political choice that's represented in, in, in each election and, and really figured out you know, what the costs are to them personally and, and to society at large and what the benefits may be and have they sort of weighed those and figured out, you know, well, you know, based on a careful consideration of all sides, this is where I should stand. Have they, have they really done that? Or is it possible that their genes just simply tell them to vote that way? And although, you know, when we, when we go um, and participate in a, in a voting process, um, we certainly feel like we are, it, it is ourselves that are making these decisions um, to vote, uh, making the decision what sort of um, person or, or issue represents our interests and needs. Um, but there has been some research um, in the past decade or so that does indicate that there may, in fact, be a role of genetics in our participation in voting, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. So um, one of the best ways uh, to examine the role of genetics in just about any issue is by um, dealing with uh, monozygotic twins. These are identical twins. Um, as you can see here, the um, uh, Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen, they don't, they don't look the same anymore because they're both you know, highly embroiled in you know, the fashion world and they've, they've sort of um, modified their appearance, but in general, you know, we sort of expect identical twins to, to look alike, and they do. Um, the, the other side, the, um, um, uh, the non-identical twins, we call those dizygotic or fraternal twins, um, they, they have uh, arisen when two eggs have been fertilized and, and are carried to term at the same time. Monozygotic twins are one egg that splits in half, and so all the genes in the one twin are exactly the same as in the other twin. So that's why these are perfect for uh, genetic studies. So there was a study done um, about uh, five or six years ago um, where they used um, 396 Los Angeles voters, uh, presumably the Olsen twins are included in, potentially in this, in this data set. Um, of these twins, um, uh, all the voters that they looked at were, were twins, uh, 168 identical twins, uh, 102 non-identical twins, um, and they were all same-sex siblings because uh, they wanted to, um, they didn't want to have a situation where there's a, a brother and a sister uh, non-identical twin, so they didn't want to you know, obscure it with the effects of potentially gender. So what they did was um, they were interested in the question of, well, okay, how often do people vote? Do genetics play a role in determining the very fact that we go out and participate, the very fact that we go out and are driven to vote, the fact, you know, the, what, what pushes us into the system? And so when they looked at the correlation uh, for identical twins, they found a 0.71 uh, correlation and just just to put that in perspective uh, a, a correlation of one means that there is an, the only thing cr causing this is genetics um, so anything uh, pretty close to one is genetics uh, non-identical twins it was a 0.5 correlation so it was basically not very not really correlated at all um, what that amounted to that the uh, if you take the difference between the non-identical twins and the identical twins 53 percent of the voting behavior um, presumably of, of uh, extrapolated to all of us is caused by our genes. So because they were able to you know, eliminate all the variables by focusing in on the identical twins, they are able to determine that 53% of what makes us go out, so more than half of what causes us to go and participate in, in a democratic process 
is our genes. Now, there was a similar study. It was, it was done by actually a graduate student who came out of the first uh, research group um, that was looking at party affiliation. And again, this is another thing that you might think, you know, well, you know, my political feelings and my, my affinity for a certain political party is based on my own choices by, you know, carefully reasoned uh, decision-making process and, and I've, I've looked at the arguments and, and the people on the other side don't make any sense at all. Um, and you might think that. However, um, they did another uh, series of experiments. Um, they, uh, they actually did this at a, um, it was a twin fest. It was like a huge convention where all these twins come. It's, I've seen pictures of it. It's very surreal. Everybody looks like, you know, double doppelgangers. Um, but they, they got their hands on 706 twins. It was heavily weighted uh, towards the identical twins. So they had 556 identical, 159 identical twins. And they just bas basically asked them uh, a simple political survey. You know, where do you land on the political spectrum? Um, are you Democrat or Republican? Do you consider yourself liberal, conservative, moderate, whatever? Basically, what's your political identity? And they did the same sort of analysis um, that, they, that they did prior. And they found that um, the environmental effects, so the non-genetic um, contribution to that decision, uh, it was more than half. It was about 54%. Um, but genetics still played almost half, 46% of the reason why these people were affiliated with the political party that they were was based on their genes. Now, um, before I uh, leave that, I will point out that they did, um, they also asked them questions about how enthusiastically they support certain political parties. So how, how zealous they were, how, um, um, how active they were um, in politics. And that actually had no correlation with genetics. So it seems that genetics, um, at least based on the research that we have right now, um, will contribute to uh, what direction politically we're pointed at. It might not determine how active we are, um, you know, whether you just simply vote with a political party or whether you run as a candidate for a political party. That doesn't seem to be um, correlated with genetics, at least not yet. So I just thought that was something kind of interesting to think about um, is, you know, the effect of genetics as, uh, as we are going into, as we are participating right now in, in voting for our next board of directors. Um, so in respect to that, I did want to um, go through the basic instant runoff voting system because this is how, um, this is, was actually written into the, our bylaws that we would use the IRV system for our elections. And not a lot of people are familiar with it. it this is a system that is implemented um, in different uh, sovereign countries in, in the world right now. Um, even in, here in the United States, there are several um, cities and localities. San Francisco uses instant runoff voting, for example. And, uh, and we felt that it was um, a, a more, um, I don't know if I want to say fair, that has a lot of connotation to it, but we, we thought it was a, a better way of determining um, what the, the general sentiments were of our membership in, in regards to who they wanted to be represented by. Um, so most of you are familiar with basic plurality voting, and that's what, what most people are familiar with. Um, that's how we elect the President of the United States, for example. If it, basically, anybody can, can run and be on the ballot, and you vote, and the person who gets the highest number of votes wins, even if they don't have a majority of the vote. Um, in a two-party system, if there's only two <laughs> viable candidates basically running, um, it's sort of basically uh, assumed that one, pre one candidate will get a majority, otherwise, you know, otherwise it's totally split and then you run into weird situations. But in situations where you have multiple political parties that have viable candidates, um, you can actually see uh, a person winning that election that hasn't won a majority of the votes, uh, such as what happened in the 2000 election. Um, and so I wanted to sort of go through a sample ballot, and I'll, I'll use sort of the paradigm of the 2000 uh, presidential election just to demonstrate uh, what the differences would be with an instant runoff voting uh, and a standard plurality voting um, setting. So here we've got our ballot. Uh, we've got four candidates, um, Bush, Gore, Nader, and Buchanan. Um, but instead of choosing just one candidate uh, in the instant runoff voting, you actually you designate your preference. So you designate who is your first preference, who is your second preference, third and fourth, is, uh, basically you can go through the entire ballot that way. Um, and so it would look something like this. So you, this person uh, is a definitely a Nader supporter, um, but their second choice would be Gore. Uh, after Gore, they would go with Bush, and then their last choice would be Buchanan. So this is basically what this would look like. They're indicating first preference, second preference, third preference, et cetera. 
So if you, um, if you take the sample uh, results from this election, let's say, um, if you could have a majority situation uh, come up where uh, the candidate Bush would get 51% of the vote, Gore gets 46, Nader gets 2%, Buchanan gets 1%. So this is this could happen in uh, 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 runoff voting where the, by simply calculating up the first preferences, you have a very you have a simple majority. Uh, candidate Bush wins. Okay. You could also have a situation where there's no majority, uh, where candidate Bush gets 58.95, Gore gets 48.94, Nader gets 1.73, and Buchanan gets 0.38% of the vote. This is actually what happened uh, in Florida in 2000. Now, with uh, the plurality system, um, the Bush, even though he's 0.015% above, he still wins the whole thing. Um, with the instant runoff voting system, if you haven't gotten a majority, if you haven't gotten uh, 50 plus 1% of the vote, then you go into the, the runoff. And I'll show you what that looks like. So first we take all the different candidates and we look at uh, where they've uh, where their votes have tallied. So this is the first round. So this is basically calculating up all the first preferences. So Bush got 48.95, Gore 48.94, Nader uh, 1.73, and Buchanan 0.38. Um, but there is no majority in this situation. So in the instant runoff system, <clears throat> we strike out the, uh, the lowest scoring candidate, the person who got the lowest number of first preference votes. We strike him out and we add his votes to um, the other candidates. So of all the Buchanan voters, uh, those whose second preferences was Gore, was Bush, go to him. That raises him to 49.28%. Um, obviously, it was the majority of the Buchanan votes. Um, Gore doesn't go up very much, and neither does Nader. So most of the people that voted for Buchanan, uh, their second preference was Bush. So candidate Bush gets uh, his votes. But after a second round, there's still no majority. So we have to go another round. So then we go to the next lowest um, scoring candidate, which is Nader. We take his 1.74% and we distribute them to the other two candidates that are left. And we see um, that most of those ended up on the, for candidate Gore. So uh, the, it, candidate Bush goes to 49.45%. Candidate Gore goes to 50.55%, which brings him above the majority and makes him the winner. So this is the instant runoff voting um, that's how that process works. It's, once you get a hang of it, it seems very simple. Um, the, the, the basic tenet of it is that somebody has to win a majority or else they're not going to get elected. So at least with the instant runoff system, you can guarantee that whoever is the elected person at least has won a majority of, if not first preference votes, second preference or third, et cetera. So, um, I just wanted to point out to you all, uh, if you haven't gotten your ballots to Larry, Larry uh, McIntyre is right over there. He's our secretary. He's handling all the ballots right now. This is what it looks like. Um, we have uh, six named positions, executive director, education director, social director, outreach director, youth director, finance director. Um, there are no more directors than anybody else. These are just positions that have specific uh, responsibilities and duties that come along with them. So these are the candidates that we have currently for those positions. And you can indicate your preference right there. Uh, we have basically two for each, I think. So one or two. And then with the at-large directors, we have um, a pretty wide field of people up in these. The at-large directors are people that serve on the board of directors. Um, they have just as much of a vote on the board as anyone else. Uh, but they don't have any specific responsibilities as outlined in the bylaws. Um, and we have the, the bylaws allow us to have up to six. So you can vote for, um, well, you can vote for as many as you want. You can go all the way down the list if you want. But um, it, there will only be six elected. So you go through the at-large directors and indicate your preference, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you're done. Then get your ballot over to Larry, and we will uh, announce the results once everything has been calculated and tabulated. So thank you for your time. Happy voting.